And um, so this this week I just picked out a chapter, kind of at, at random, kind of, to read and to learn about. And it's Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. It's a good chapter. It was written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was, some people say, the founder of Christianity. Or some would say the founder of the church. The Apostle Paul was very important in our Bible. He wrote many, many books of the Bible. And, and many of the books that he wrote in the Bible were letters to people. He was always traveling, starting new churches. And sometimes he was in jail. And he was always writing letters to people at different churches to make sure they were doing okay. He was checking them on them all the time. And one thing Paul had in common with me, he did cry uh, about time. I did a wedding yesterday. Um, I had a kind of, I have kind of a distant relative, once removed, twice removed, marriage, death, whatever. And she, I found out, has become homeless. And she called me up and said, I'm, I'm getting married, I want you to come and, and marry us. And I don't know exactly where they're gonna do this, but we had to drive up to Inverness, Crystal River, and we had to find out where they were camping, where they were staying, so we could go and, and marry them. Her name's Irma, and the guy she married, his nickname is Cowboy, not the one that we know from around here, but he's another cowboy up there. So we found them in a the field on the edge of the woods. They had four or five of their friends with them that were also homeless. And uh, we, uh, we gave them a marriage ceremony fit for a king. Of course I cried. <laughs> I don't know, just sitting out there in that field with people so humble going through such difficult times, and to have a privilege to be out there and marry them, it meant, it meant a lot to me. And the Apostle Paul, you know, like I said, most people don't realize this unless they read carefully. Several places in the Bible where he was crying. So I feel in good company there. So we're gonna start right here, verse 12. This is a letter Paul wrote to the Romans. As I would say in modern times, to the Italians. When Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, he was staying in Corinth, a city called Corinth. You can go there today to the city called Corinth, and you can go through the straits on a cruise ship, and you can see, you can stop and see the city. In, in those days, Corinth was considered a very corrupt city. Lots of evil, lots of worshiping idols, false gods. Uh, crazy things going on. And Paul started a church in Corinth. And you might remember he wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, letters to that church. That church had all kinds of problems going on. Everything from getting drunk during the uh, communion services to being selfish with the food that was supposed to be there for everybody to share. And even adultery happening in that church. But Paul wrote this letter from that location, from that church, to the Romans. And the book of the Romans is probably maybe Paul's greatest writing. A lot of historians, even people that aren't Christians, will say that the book of Romans is perhaps the greatest book ever written. It's just so intense and so deep, so well thought out, so logical. Paul was a real theologian. You know, Paul started his career off by killing Christians, by murdering them, and locking them up in jail. And then Paul got saved. You know, like the song says, I saw the light, I saw the light. Well, Paul saw the light one day, didn't he? Just like most of you here have seen the light. And God came into his heart and changed him. He changed his name from Saul to Paul. So now he is in Corinth writing a letter to the Romans. And this is the 12th chapter of that letter. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual worship. Wow, uh, that's that's a, that's pretty heavy. He's asking the people in the church in Rome, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice. Look at all the things we do with our bodies. Oh, we overeat. We drink too much. We take too many prescription drugs from our doctors. We don't exercise enough. We, we don't take that good of care of our bodies sometimes. Some of us do, you know. Once in a while, you'll see somebody that really does. But most of us are not good taking care of our bodies. And our bodies are full of all kinds of desires that are not righteous and not good for us as Christians, not good for our, our neighbors and our community and our society. So our bodies will push us to do wrong things, crave things that we don't need or should be having. So knowing that, Paul says to these people, present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, in the old days, they would put a lamb up on the altar and have a burnt offering. It's basically referring to that idea here. He's saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And he says, this is your spiritual worship. Presenting your body to God is your spiritual worship. That's how we worship God. By giving ourselves to Him. Overcoming the lust of the flesh, the weakness of the flesh, and living a holy and righteous life. So that's a lot to start off with. And then he says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be transformed, do not be uh, conformed to the world, but be transformed. That's what God calls us as Christians. Don't act like everybody else out there. With the selfishness and the greed and the pride and all the crazy things. Don't give in to being mean and nasty and using bad language and attacking people and seeking revenge. God asks us to be a, a different kind of person, not conformed to the ways of this world, but to be transformed, changed radically. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that's what God is doing in your hearts here. You know, this morning I ran into Sam. And uh, he says, oh, I'm not coming to church today. I'm going to a different church today because my friends have been inviting me. And then he also told me he, he's been praying for me. And Sam goes, that's pretty good, huh, for me, huh? And to see Sam and... All of you that come here so so regularly, knowing that maybe you won't even be in church if you weren't coming here, and knowing that God is transforming your lives, maybe little by little, but people that are coming here, their faith is growing, their prayer life is growing, the time they spend with God is growing. How many here are going to attest to that, that your spiritual life is growing from coming to this church? And I, you know me, I try to preach right from the Bible and not mix in too much of my own opinions. Because the Bible is our source and our guide. And it's changing our lives. And I was so happy that Sam, it's maybe a person that maybe a couple years ago went to been praying for me. I went to been visiting a friend's church. He said, but I'll be back next week. <laughs> okay, you better be. But that's a blessing. You know, when I hear different people say things to me like, like that, I realize how much good is happening here and how much God is transforming lives. And the way that we transform our lives, it says here, is by the renewing of our minds. The renewing of our minds. Now, if you fill your mind with a lot of garbage, garbage in, garbage out, so to speak, but you fill your mind with the Spirit of God and with the truth of God, with with the Bible verses and with prayers and with love and kindness, just fill your mind with good things and that will help to transform your life. I know sometimes I probably watch TV more than I should. And sometimes that's just a lot of junk going in there. 
But of course, are you, how many of you like watching YouTube? I, I watch YouTube quite a bit. It's always something to learn. But only for educational reasons. But we need to put the Word of God in our minds. And then he says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So sometimes people are like, what's God's will for my life? What does God have in store for me? You know, God has a, a plan and a purpose for everybody. And the best way to find that is just to stay with your mind focused on God. And he will help you discern what is his will. He will help you discern what is good and what is acceptable. And what is perfect. Now the next part here is talking about grace. That's like I said earlier today, that's one thing I love about God. He gives us these goals that are almost impossible to reach. Then he throws at us a boatload of grace. Thank goodness for the grace of God. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. That's pretty good, huh? Don't think of yourself more highly than you should. It's, it's uh, easy to be prideful, isn't it? It's easy to be prideful. And to think that you're better than other people. You know, the Bible, men and women worship together. That was very rare back in those days. In the Bible, servants and masters worship together. In the Bible, people of different races worship together. And no one was to think that they were better than another group of people. God loves all of us. You know, there's 200 nations on this earth, and sometimes we forget God loves every person in every nation. So don't think more highly of yourself than you, than you ought. But think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, all the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Everyone has a different gift. You know, sometimes, um, you know, when you're a pastor like myself, people can look at you like you're special or more important. And I always try to discourage people looking at me that way. Because I'm just one member of the body and I'm just doing one job that God's called me to do. God's called me to get up and speak and to teach His Word. And I, I, I dragged my feet for a long time. I wanted to be sure that God had called me to do this. But each one of you has got a calling too. Each one of you does different things that make this church what it is. One, just being here. Just being here. That's the biggest part about it. And different ones of you do different things. Some of you are good at praying. And you pray a lot for us. Some of you are good at just serving others and taking care of people. Or just taking care of anything that needs to be done. And I look around and I see people that have blessed my heart, sometimes just a hug or word of encouragement or a prayer. So everyone's got a different job to do. Not all have the same function, but we are one body in Christ. Now it says here now, let us use these gifts. Let us use these gifts. If your gift is prophecy, use it in proportion to our faith. Prophecy here doesn't mean telling the future, it means teaching the word of God. If service is your gift, in serving one another, did you know that service is a gift? It's one of the most important gifts there is. Remember when we did the book of John, all the examples of when Jesus served his disciples, served other people, took care of things like food, fishing, helped them with their fishing, you know. Wash their feet. Jesus was the greatest servant of all. And if your gift is serving, you might not be noticed much. You might not be up here with a microphone. But your gift is so important. And I just look at right now, 
a number of you that do so much to help this church that are have had to the servant. And God just loves that about you. God loves a servant's attitude. Now, if your gift is teaching, then do, then do that. Do the teaching. And the one who exhorts in exhorting, exhorting is kind of like encouraging people, you know, bringing the best out of people. The one who leads, leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Acts of mercy. If someone's in jail, what did Jesus say? Go visit them. If someone's in the hospital, what did Jesus say? Go visit them. If someone needs a glass of water, what did Jesus say? Flow them, feed them. These are acts of mercy. And you should always do it cheerfully. Right, Michelle? Yeah. We have people. Michelle's the head I of it. My parents, though, she has her moments. I'm we, not going to lie. <laughs> you know, we have different people that come and help with feeding the homeless four nights a week. Most of you know that we do that. Our, our main night we help out with is Mondays and uh, Jim does a lot of that every week. But I know it says here we should do acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And most of the time, people that are doing that are very cheerful about it. Yeah. Very committed to it. And they feel so blessed and honored that they can help you do others. But once in a while, it can get you down. <laughs> it's so much work and such a commitment, you know. But the Bible says to do it with cheerfulness. God also said that God loves a cheerful giver. That's why I tell people when you give the offering, give what you're able to give and give what you're happy to give. Because we don't want any sad money in our offering. That's right. I'd rather have 10 cheerful dollars than 100 unhappy dollars. Amen? So it's all in cheerfulness that we serve God. This is the neat, one of the neat things about serving God. It seems so demanding. It seems like such a huge sacrifice. But once you start doing it, it's nothing but joy. Nothing but cheerfulness. I love coming here on Sundays. It's a big commitment, especially when I have gigs on Saturday night and another gig Sunday afternoon. Then I have to come in the middle of all that and I've got to preach a sermon. It's not easy, but I tell you what, I'm happy. I'm happy being here and serving God. Well. So you find what God's what business service is for you and you do it cheerfully. If you're not doing it cheerfully, you need to get down on your knees and pray and maybe ask God for something else. He'd rather you be doing it. But every Christian should have a ministry. Every Christian should have something that you're doing to help others. You might just go to a nursing home once a month and visit people. Or you might go to hospitals or you might go to the jails. Whatever you can do, you might make some crafts to give away to people. Whatever you can do, do it cheerfully and it will be a blessing for you more than anybody else. All right, now this next part is pretty cool. This last section. You know, some people say that Apostle Paul's teachings were not the same as Jesus' teachings. Now here's what Jesus taught, and Apostle Paul kind of twisted it off, twisted it a little bit and did his own thing with it. But I never believed that. The Apostle Paul never knew Jesus personally. He was not one of the disciples that followed Jesus around. He lived when he was alive when Jesus was alive. But he didn't know him. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And that bright light came down and God spoke to him. And Paul says that he learned his gospel message straight from Jesus Christ himself. That's how he learned his gospel message. And when I read this next section, I wanted to remind you of Jesus' teachings. And especially the Sermon on the Mount. Here we are in verse 9. Let love be genuine. That's a good one. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, Jesus says sometimes you come to a banquet and you want to sit up right at the head of the table 
in the special seats that are for the, the, the better people, you know. But Jesus says, don't be seeking that kind of honor. Go to the end of the table and sit, be humble. And Jesus was the perfect example of honoring others and being humble. So we don't want to be puffing ourselves up. We want to be lifting up other people. So every day you go, think about how you lift up another person. And never put them down. And don't puff yourself up. You will get your reward in due time. But serve God as a humble Christian. Serve the people around you. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So be fervent, be zealous in your spirit. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be patient. That's what I'm going to learn. Be patient in the tribulations. I think, Lord, please get these legs working a little better. What's going on? I'm taking too long here. My poor wife had to push me around in a wheelchair for two days on a cruise ship. That was terrible. I'm like, Lord, please, what's going on? But he tells us to be patient in tribulation and to be constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Always pray. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. You know, we're supposed to take care of each other. If one of us needs prayer, needs a, lift, needs a hug, needs a lifting up, or even if someone needs financial help, whatever the need is. In the Bible here, in the New Testament, they took care of each other. They really did. Show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Now here he's starting to sound like Jesus. He's starting to sound a lot like Jesus here. And this is where Jesus goes off the rails, man. You know, most people are like, be good to your friends, be good to your family, whatever to everybody else, you know. But I tell you what, man, Jesus said so many times, you've got to forgive others. You've got to be forgiving. And don't seek revenge. And Apostle Paul is echoing this teaching here. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as depends on you, live peacefully with all. There was a part in the Bible where it says, Jesus said, if you bring your gifts to God, but you've got ought in your heart against another person or them against you, before you bring your gifts to God, don't make things right. Amen. This is a priority to God, that we make things right in our relationship with other people. If we need to apologize, we apologize. Even if it's not 100% our fault. You know, people go back and forth so much. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. You did this. You did that. But that's not the way of Christ. That's not humility. We can find our part in it. We can apologize if we need to. We can ask forgiveness. And we can extend forgiveness. It's up to us to be the big person. To do what's right. And one thing Paul adds to that here is live peacefully with all so far as depends on you. Sometimes you try everything you can to make peace with a person. But they won't have it, right? They won't have it. They're not going to have peace. It could be a family member. It happens a lot, right? How many people here have a family member that you're not getting along with that good? Not on the outs with it. And, uh... I know my, my uh, wife, when we got together, her father wasn't happy that she was with me. So I was just a homeless musician with long hair. Didn't think I'd be very good for her. She was wrong. I was great for her. But, but uh, I told my wife, and she's a sweetheart, you keep being kind towards him. You try to keep in touch with him. 
send him a Christmas card, whatever you can do. And Lord would have it, he turned around his ways, and he gets to know me. He goes, you know, the guy Dave's not so bad. So if you just do what's right over time, sometimes people come around. If they don't, that's not your fault. But you got to do what's right and be humble and forgiving. That's hard to do sometimes. Never avenge yourselves. Never. Never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God's going to take care of this. God has a sense of justice. It's not for us to try to implement that justice. We implement love and kindness. God will take care of vengeance if it's needed. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what are you going to do? Feed him. If he is thirsty, you're going to give him something for his drink. For by so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. You know, in those days, they would put coals on their head if they were in mourning. And, you know, people sometimes put coals on their face today. And it shows that you're in mourning. You're seeking forgiveness. You're repenting. So when you talk about putting coals on the person's head, it's saying that when we treat our enemies with kindness, when we feed our enemies, give drink to our enemies, show love and forgiveness to our enemies, eventually they come around and repent. And their lives are changed by our example. The last verse of this chapter. Do not be overcome with evil. But overcome evil. With good. Boy if our world could learn that lesson. If our governments could learn that lesson. If our people, our leaders. And each one of us could learn that lesson. We don't overcome evil by sending more evil back. We overcome evil by sending good back. Evil comes our way, we send the good back. And I've had that happen in my life many times. Where someone came against me with evil. Sometimes maybe as far as even punching me, knocking me, knocking me out. And I had to come back with good. But that's the one lesson we can learn today then it's been successful in your day. How many of you have something in your life, someone that you're looking at as an enemy, or someone you're estranged from, or someone that you're looking at like, I'm not apologizing, I'm not reaching out to them, they've got to call me, they've got to tell me what they did wrong. You know? This is so much what God wants to change in our lives. He wants to change our hearts and transform us. So I want all of you this week to think about that. Take it seriously. And try to see how you can make peace and spread more love and goodness in the world. And not be a part of the hatred and the evil.